All right. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Yunus Lari. Uh, I'm an attorney and alumna of Florida Coastal School of Law and admissions counselor in the Office of Admissions and your host for today's webinar. I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. These webinars have been growing in popularity and that encourages my colleagues and me to uh, bring you the materials you want to hear and learn more about. So once again, thank you for your participation and let's begin. Today, I'm excited to be joined by two very special guests. First, we will hear from one of our current student clinician, Mrs. Alex Brown. I know Alex from uh, when she used to help us out in the Office of Admissions, uh, as you will see, Alex has uh, endless energy and enthusiasm for law in general and family law in particular. She has been uh, uh, she uh, she has been a very active student. Is gearing up for graduation soon, very soon. Has bar prep in the near future to look forward to. Uh, you're gonna love it, Alex. And if I'm not mistaken, already has a position secured for after the bar exam as a practicing family law attorney. So many congratulations are in order for Alex. Congratulations in advance uh, to our very own uh, Mrs. Uh, Brown. Alex is going to talk to us about her experience with the family law clinic. That would be our first guest speaker. After that, it is time for our headliner speaker of the night, our rock star professor and the director of our family law clinic, Professor Natalie Tuttle. Prior to joining uh, the Coastal Law team, Professor Tuttle was a judicial law clerk for the Honorable Douglas uh, Shivers and uh, Larry Smith at the First District Court of Appeal, Tallahassee, Florida, while serving as an uh, adjunct professor and the years between. She continued to practice in the area of complex commercial litigation, actively litigating cases in both federal and state courts. Professor Tuttle has also practiced in the area of family law, most notable in association with the firm of Cooper, Rich, and uh, Lantenberg, uh, represented the chairman of the board of WorldCom in the WorldCom securities class action pending in the Southern District of New York, as well as other related state cases pending across the nation uh, with claims in the billions. Professor Tuttle is a certified family appellate and uh, county mediator and has conducted over 500 mediations in Northeast uh, Florida. Professor Tuttle also serves as a custody uh, evaluator slash social investigator for the Fourth Judicial Circuit and surrounding circuits. She has performed over 100 evaluation and has ap appeared as an expert in state court. Professor Tuttle is currently the professor slash supervising attorney of the family law in-house clinic. All right. I hope you guys enjoy my guests' presentations today and take advantage of their wealth of experience and knowledge. As always, I encourage all of you to ask questions. Asking questions help tailoring these webinars to better fit your needs. You may use the chatting box on the left side of your screen to type in your questions, and we will do our best to answer them. Now, Without any further ado, I give you Mrs. Alex Brown. Alex, it's all yours. Hi, everyone. How are you doing tonight? Uh, my name is Alexandria, and I am a third-year law student. I am um, currently starting uh, to study for the bar. I just want to give you a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm a Jacksonville native. I grew up here, was born and raised, I was homeschooled, and I went to the University of North Florida, swoop, for all of my uh, UNF alumni out there. I got my bachelor's degree in political science and sociology, and I graduated in 2013 and started Coastal shortly after in 2014. Um, I was very involved in campus. As Eunice said, I worked in the admissions department my second uh, year of law school. I was the treasurer of the Family Law Society my second year, and also I became president of Family Law Society my third year. I am an American Matrimonial Lawyer Scholarship recipient, and I am a member, a student member of the Florida Family Law Ends of Court. 
Uh, so I graduate in just a few weeks. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for the well wishes. I graduate in just a few weeks and I will be taking the bar in July. And as Eunice said, I have secured a position as an associate attorney at a family law firm here in Jacksonville. So that's very exciting. Okay. So my time in the clinic, I added a little kind of fun picture there. I want half the value of the house and the kids every other weekend. I want him thrown into a vat of lava filled with a special piranha that can live in lava. That is family law. Well, kind of. Um, so I loved being in the family law clinic and I have been in for four semesters, about a year and a half, and that is the max that you possibly can be in, 15 credit hours. Um, the Family Law Clinic kind of gives you a sense of pride in what you're doing while you're still in law school. It gives you an opportunity to kind of give back to your community um, because we help a lot of low-income um, litigants and you're still able to kind of learn and uh, also you are able to be mentored while you are in the clinic. It's kind of like working in a law firm but your boss is a teacher and your boss kind of um, goes through every pleading. Uh, talks through mediation, talks through um, a client interview with you, and you kind of get to practice but still be taught. Um, I think it's a great opportunity. All the clinics are amazing. Um, the areas of law that we primarily focus in that I've um, had an opportunity to deal with are domestic violence, divorces, of course, custody and parenting plans, child support, social investigations. I um, did a step-parent adoption, which was fabulous. Uh, I've done military divorces, and we've also served as an attorney ad litem um, for our case. So our clinic also deals with modifications, enforcement, a little bit of probate, a little bit of dependency and the delinquency, and appeals, which I'm sure Professor, Professor Tuttle will be talking more about. Um, being in the clinic, though, doesn't just expose you to family law. You would think um, all you're ever going to really do is divide forks and knives, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, being in the clinic kind of gives you, gets you exposed to all areas of law that you don't really think are involved in family law, such as um, property, because you're dividing um, houses, you're dividing estates, all of those things. You get an idea of tax law. You get some business law because people own businesses, and that is something that is divided um, when you get divorced. Immigration, that is a big one that's coming up, and I'm sure there's another one that will um, be talking about the immigration clinic, but we kind of have lap, like overlap cases. Um, so you have to know immigration, bankruptcy, and estate planning. So my favorite case so far in the clinic was a step-parent adoption. I, um, I know sometimes people think family law is so sad and you're tearing families apart, but actually in this case, I got to put a family together. So we had a young uh, boy who had lived with his mom and his stepdad for many, many years, and um, they had been a family. He was just the only one without their last name had never had any contact with his dad. So we got to go to um, court and petition the court for a step-parent adoption and make them a family. So now all of them have the same name. His dad on his birth certificate, it was his stepfather. Um, it's kind of, it was a great moment and they were so happy. They were crying and just jumping for joy outside of the courthouse. And um, it was a great, great experience. So um, my, Crazy case, okay, so my least favorite case was um, a client who questioned my integrity while in a case, um, which is a big deal because in the clinic you kind of get the first case, you get the first um, real taste of what it's going to be like being in a law firm, having real clients who are going to say, oh, you didn't return my phone call within five minutes, you're not professional or you're not ethic. and Lucky for me, I had that happen while I was in the clinic, and I had all of my clinic professors sitting there with me, um, sitting there with me uh, talking about, you know, this is what happens, this is how you um, approach this, and I was able to resolve the case. Still not my favorite. It sits out, um, it stands out as one of the cases that I um, remember and hurt, but I think it was a great opportunity for me as a clinician to have that experience happen in an environment that kind of um, preps me 
for practice. So that would have happened in my in a law firm, my first day of work, I might have, you know, kind of freaked out. But um, we got to have that opportunity to have it in the clinic with my professors there, and they were able to, you know, walk me through it, how to talk with a client, how to make them feel more reassured um, that I was actually doing my job and I was I was being an ethical person. Um, so moving on, sorry I rambled. So why do a clinic? Okay, so I have a little, another little funny here. Your Honor, since this is my first official court case, the defense respectfully requests permission to let my mother videotape it. Why do a clinic? So that this isn't you when you become a practicing attorney. You don't have your mom come in um, and sit in on your first real case. You'll do your first case in law school. Um, clinics provide you not only an opportunity to learn hands-on, but you also get a mentorship program um, kind of built into your curriculum. And so with that being said, you get the opportunity to do things that you would do in practice. So first you learn how to conduct research. Um, you learn factual and legal research. So you learn how to do interviews and collect discovery, but you also learn how to search the law for your case and present it to a judge or write um, a pleading or motion or go to a hearing, things like that. Uh, you learn how to interview your clients. You draft real life documents. Um, I went to my interview, just a fun story, I went to my interview for the firm that I work for, or I'm going to work for in a couple of weeks, um, and they asked, what type of pleadings have you? And my response was, too many to even list. Because while in the clinic, I have had um, the, the ability to draft all types of pleadings. I have done UCCJEA affidavits. I have done notice of social security numbers. I have done a petition for dissolution of marriage. I've done a petition for step-parent adoption. I have um, drafted a social investigation report there's too many. I've done a motion to compel, motions for hearings, all of those things. So my first day of work, I will already have experience. And I'm not saying I'm a practicing attorney. I am still a newbie, but I have more experience than I would have had I not done the clinics. So you also learn how to respond to discovery, which is a big uh, thing in family law. You're going through a lot of paperwork, such as um, bank statements. You're looking at people's tax returns. You're kind of, uh, we have one case where we had to trace money from bank statements to bank statements, kind of figure out how they um, got to them or where the money went to. Uh, you negotiate with opposing counsel, which is a fun, we just did a consent final judgment where we um, sent emails back and forth, kind of um, negotiating the terms of a divorce so that we didn't have to go to trial. You argue motions in front of real life judges and magistrates. I've had the opportunity to be in front of um, probably five local judges in two different counties since I've been in the clinic, um, Clay and Duval, which are both in the fourth judicial circuit. And uh, you get to go in front of magistrates. I've been in front of a few magistrates. You get to mediate. Mediation is a fun part of family law because it's a little more informal and um, you get to kind of work things out with your client. You get to talk with the mediator. You get to talk with the opposing side. It's a great um, alternative dispute resolution, um, like hands-on experience. And then also you get a, a really good in-depth understanding of, of the area of law, um, not just family law. Like I said, you learn property law, tax law, business law, immigration. You learn bankruptcy. You learn estate planning. You learn how um, federal laws flow into um, state laws like um, there's a, I know Professor Tuttle can probably type it in here, uh, Freedom of Information Act, being able to track down somebody if you can't find them, um, if you can't find where they are to serve them or to get them notice of the divorce or an adoption or the termination of parental rights. Um, you just kind of learn a, a lot of skills that flow into other areas of law. And then um, lastly, why do a clinic? Because it will give you an opportunity before you get your first job to realize that you love this area of law or you hate it. So I have found that you are either extremely passionate. When you get into law school, you will come in with your hat on that says, I'm going to be a corporate law attorney. And then first day of law school, um, you realize that I love corporate law and then take contracts. And I really hate corporate law. 
And then you do, you're like, oh, family law is going to be my thing. You go into the family law clinic and you're like, man, I just cannot deal with the people. It's better to do it while you're in law school and kind of get a gist and make sure that you actually enjoy what you're going to do before you go into that area of law. Um, and it kind of just gives you a heads up of what you're kind of signing on to. So that's where it goes. Okay. Oh yes, and so Professor Tuttle, and you get to you get to realize that you're going to litigate cases regardless of the type of law. You're learning litigation skills as well in the clinic, so it's great. Okay, tips and tricks. So I am a third year law student, so I've been here for three years. So I have a lot of law school tips that I would like to give you, my incoming one Ls, my zero Ls, if you will. Engage. That is the theme of my tips and tricks. Engage. Get involved in campus. I was very involved on campus. I love, love, love being on at school. I love um, knowing the staff, the faculty, uh, and all of the other students I engaged. I got involved in campus, like I said earlier. I was, um, I was president of Family Law Society. I just passed that torch over a few weeks ago. I was treasurer of Family Law Society. I was also involved in Human Rights Law Society and Criminal Law Society. Um, I just graduated with pro bono honors, so I have been involved in the community. Um, that engagement has been very important um, part of not just my law school career, but also, I believe, um, getting me ready to practice, be practice ready. Since I am practicing in the area, it was uh, in the area of Jacksonville, it was a great opportunity for me um, to get involved on campus and outside. Um, next, read for class. Read efficiently and be prepared to answer questions for your professors. So I kind of get nervous when I'm on the spot. If you can't tell, I'm kind of rambling right now. Um, so I did this awesome trick where when I would read, I would also color brief. This means is when you're reading, you come in with like 10 different color highlighters and you highlight the certain thing that you're being prepared for. So my facts were highlighted in green and my issue was highlighted in orange. My rule was highlighted in pink. My procedure was highlighted in a purple color and then my holding was highlighted in blue. So that when a professor called on me and said, Miss Brown, what is the holding in international um, shoe? I could flip to international shoe, look for blue, and then be able to sprout it off right away. It kind of um, is a fast way to efficiently read and effectively be ready for class. Highly suggest um, picking up tricks like that if you're going to go to law school, if you're going to be um, in class, and if you get nervous on the spot. Um, with that being said, go to class, engage in class, ask questions, raise your hand, read all the material, um, figure out how you like to study, and find resources that make studying in that area better. So, for example, if you do well doing practice questions, I would suggest um, finding a type of supplement that helps with co practice questions like Lexis Q&A or examples and explanations. Those are great books. I have a ton of them behind me right now. Um, those help with practice questions. If you do flashcards, get the app, write your flashcards on your computer and go through them when you're sitting at the store. Um, I'm an outliner, so I like to create effective outlines and I also do um, case matrices because it just helped me stay organized and helped me study better. Um, so I definitely suggest finding a way for you to just be a good student and be an effective student. And then last but not least, compete. Now I don't say this in a way to compete with other students. I'm saying this to compete with yourself. Um, be better than you were last semester. That is my, that has been my goal my entire time at law school be better than I was, even in the clinic, uh, do better than I was yesterday. Don't make that same mistake in the next pleading. Um, don't forget to do this when you're um, drafting something or sending it away or, you know, um, compete with yourself to get something done in a different manner or to research this more effectively. Compete with yourself. Be respectful to your professors and your other students um, and realize that these people are your colleagues. Uh, at the end of the day, when you look at into um, the community, into your classroom, they're not only going to be um, your colleagues in the community, but they're also going to be your boss one day, a judge, or an opposing counsel. Um, 
funny thing with that is that Professor Tuttle, who you're going to hear from in just a minute, um, actually might be opposing counsel for me in about four months because I work locally with the clinic and we also have cases that overlap. So who is my professor right now? who's my boss, who's my supervising attorney, in six months may be opposing counsel, and in five years could be a judge in the community. So always be respectful, and um, that is all I have for you today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me, and best of luck in your future endeavors. All right, well, Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, uh, Professor Tuttle, I see that you're already answering a lot of questions. Uh, Alex will also uh, uh, graciously stick around for any other questions that might uh, uh, might still uh, be uh, on your mind at the end of these presentations. Uh, so uh, stick around if you have questions for Alex for later on. But now, the moment we've all been waiting for, I'm excited about this. Uh, to hear from uh, our headliner of tonight, Professor uh, Tuttle. Uh, Professor Tuttle, without any further ado, uh, it's all yours. There you go. All right. Well, hello, everybody, and, and welcome. Uh, can you put the PowerPoint up? Um, I actually made a PowerPoint for this. But anyway, I'm Professor Tuttle, and I'm the, like Alex said, I'm the supervising attorney of the Family Law Clinic. And since I got that long introduction uh, to, at the very beginning, I'm not going to uh, go through my background because, uh, because um, well, I already did that for me. I did want to add that I've had a recent experience that I thought was pretty fun, and that was I got the privilege of sitting for about five weeks um, when one of the uh, magistrate's hearing officers was out for a medical issue. I got to sit as a hearing officer in the Department of Revenue world, which is child support court. So I got to wear the black robe, actually be in a courtroom, throw some people in jail, um, and have to admit what an interesting experience it is to be on the other side of the bench and how impressed I was with the court system and how quick they process a high volume of cases. The Department of Revenue was hearing about 35 cases in a morning session and about 35 in the afternoon and did do that pretty much every day of the week. So um, I've had that uh, extraordinary opportunity to last uh, two months and, and it was really, really interesting. But I want to talk to you all about um, Florida Coastal's experiential learning. And I've got a couple of generic slides that are just about the clinic program as a whole and what the school has. And then I'll, I'll zero in on the um, family law stuff specifically, and of course, happy to answer questions if they pop up on the screen. So this, uh, for y'all who are not from Jacksonville, although it's not a picture of the actual courthouse, the, um, the picture that's showing up on the first slide is actually Professor Sullivan from our disability clinic and some of her students at the front of the uh, brand new, I say brand new, it's a couple years old now, but the brand new um, uh, courthouse in Duval County, which is really fabulous way better than the old one, I must say. Um, here is a couple of my students. We all went to court, um, handled a hearing, and I think, if I recall right, we were in the domestic violence court and watched the docket that morning. So this is some of the fall 2016 family law conditions at the courthouse, and I won't bore you with a whole bunch of pictures. This is actually from a couple of years ago. This lady right here, Christina Wilford, the blonde, is actually working at the same firm that Alex just got hired by. And at that firm is also three other former family law clinicians. So that, that firm is basically what I call the Tuttle Law Firm, although it has a different name. Um, so that particular firm is calling me because they want students that have done the clinic as practicing attorneys. So one of the reasons why you do a clinic, because the attorneys that are hiring want students or graduates who have experience, and you get experience in the, in the clinic program. So let me introduce you generally to um, just what a law school clinic is, and think about it as kind of like a medical residency. It is doing the real thing. So much like a doctor gets the doctor degree, and then they go into a hospital and they get that residency training under a supervision, it's basically the same thing except for it's in-house. It's at the law school. And 
in a clinic setting, this is why the clinics are different from an externship, you get really close supervision by your faculty member. So in my clinic, my, I meet with students every single week going through their cases. We meet more if we have a trial or a hearing or something big coming up where we're prepping and preparing for that. If you have a CLI, that's a certified legal intern, and there's technical rules on that, but basically you have enough credits, 48 hours, you've got your clearance, your background of the Florida Bar is done, and you're in a program like a clinic, you get approved by the Florida Supreme Court to have the CLI, that's the magic phrase, and that allows you, this doesn't happen in necessarily externships, there are some externships that can, mainly state attorney and public defender, but if you have a CLI, you are allowed with your supervising attorney in court with you to be the one that's doing all the argument. So you are doing the opening, the closing, the cross-examination, the direct examination, the motion arguments, whatever it is, you're the lead attorney. I'm your backup. Of course, if you pass out, I'll step in and keep on going and hopefully revive you in a, in a little while after the court's over. But, um, but you get to do it all, and that is what makes a law school clinic so unique. So in a litigation clinic like the family law clinic, you get to gain experience by drafting pleadings, and pleadings are basically documents that are filed with the court. There's a real technical definition, but I'm going to use a much broader definition. You get to draft the motions, letters to a judge, letters to opposing counsel, letters to your client, memorandums of law, appellate briefs, if we have the appellate world going. You get to do all that. You are, as far as we are concerned, the lawyer. You can't give legal advice unless I tell you to say X, Y, and Z, because I'm it's my license, but I'll tell you X, Y, and Z, and then you call the client or the opposing counsel, and you basically follow up with that and have that discussion. Um, you're able to depose the witnesses and do depositions. You will learn how to prepare litigation, full trials, evidence, how to get it in, how to walk that witness through it. Um, and family law especially, we get to conduct negotiations. You actually get a lot of transactional experience because we draft a fair amount of settlement documents, and those are just big contracts. Um, and sometimes they're very unique to the family's factual needs. Um, and then if you were doing a transactional clinic, um, you would actually be doing a lot of business documents, corporation creation and stuff like that, because um, we do have an entrepreneurial and business clinic. Um, so at Florida Coastal, we have four in-house clinics. We have a business and entrepreneurial clinic that runs basically both fall and spring. It doesn't run through the summer. It doesn't require that CLI because they don't appear in court. It is truly a transactional clinic. You have my family law clinic, which I'll talk about more in a minute. We have the human uh, immigrant and human rights clinic, which is so fabulous. And obviously right now with all the stuff in the news, it is, I hate to use the word, it is the sexiest topic in the law school right now. They handle some atrocious cases, uh, human trafficking. I mean, it is so heart-wrenching, some of the stories and some of the uh, kids that they represent and others that they represent. We do a lot of interaction with them on VAWA cases, which is uh, um, the victims of domestic violence getting special need. Um, in the immigration world, and we also help them with uh, special immigrant juvenile status cases, which are the unaccompanied minor children coming across the border. They need some special orders from a family law court in order to do some special immigration rights. And then we have a public interest research bureau. This actually used to be a pro bono program that we've now moved into a clinic. And what that particular program does is all these um, pro bono type uh, legal aid programs in a three-state area need assistance in researching on particular topics. The uh, Law School Research Public Interest Bureau Clinic provides that research, provides memorandums, and provides advice to that tri-state um, legal aid organizational programs, whoever it might be. So um, you get Jacksonville Area Legal Aid or any other kind of legal aid program, we're here to help them and support them. Um, I don't know if y'all have, have uh, research test or anything, but the Florida Coastal's Experiential Learning Program has been ranked nationally. We've gotten A's, A minuses, I'm not sure, you might have gone to a B plus once, but we've been consistently ranked in about the top 20 schools in the nation for our programming. And so it's, it's a real point of pride for the school and what we do here. All right, this is 
we have probably way more information than you need at this point of making decisions. But in-house clinics, just from a classroom perspective, are generally usually three to six credits, four to five is the norm. They are always taught by full-time faculty. There is a class component that goes with this. So we teach the substance, substantive law, we teach procedural, where that is, and just the how-to. And it's a graded class. And you actually work on real clients. Our program also has um, what's called practitioner clinics. And those are often in the evenings. They're one or two credits. They're taught by adjuncts. So basically, we have adjuncts from the community who are specialists in the area. For example, we have a trust estates lawyer who's fabulous, um, Robert Morgan, who teaches the trust and estates clinic in the evenings. So students would actually get involved with a local attorney working on live cases for that attorney who's doing those cases pro bono. The, um, those classes are tend to be in the evening. They are pass-fail. And again, you're working on real client stuff. So we have a broad spectrum of opportunities for experiential learning. And that's ex ignoring basically the externship world, in which we have a ton of opportunities there. So um, for an in-house clinic, for every credit that you're doing, you have to do 45 hours of work and class and all that counts. And for a practitioner clinic, you're just doing 50 hours total for the semester. So that's the um, general clinic world here at the law school. Just to give you a little inkling of the types of practitioner clinics we have, as we got the wills, estates, and trusts, the interviewing and counseling clinic was actually kind of, is kind of a, a feeder into our family law and immigration clinic. A lot of times they're doing the live interviews of potential clients, writing up reports, and the other clinics may use those to decide to take on cases. So students who just want experience in interviewing and counseling a potential client can actually do that um, practitioner clinic. We have veterans benefits. We have a mediation clinic. Uh, Lisa Dasher, our local mediator, is going to be teaching that. Seal and expungement, which goes into the juvenile law world. These are trying to set aside criminal um, records for emerging adults, so 17 to 18-year-olds. Um, we have the Florida Appellate Clinic. That sometimes uh, varies depending on who's teaching it. It might have a criminal focus, a family law focus, or some other particular area of law focus, depending on the professor. We have a Child Advocacy and Dependency Clinic, which is actually taught by the Guardian Ad Litem's Office and focuses a lot on representing the Children's Best Interest in Dependency Court. And then we have a naturalization clinic. We have a huge citizenship day. We just had it about two weeks ago. Um, and so we do that every year, too. So we've got some really cool programming. Um, if you go to Florida Coastal, every student here has to have at least six, six experiential learning credits to graduate. And three of those must be in a clinic or externship. But we always try to say, come be a part of our family, like Alex, who's been doing this for three semesters, and get all of your stuff in the clinic. But you can do more than one clinic. You can do my clinic and then go do the immigration clinic. Sometimes when students cross over, they actually continue to work on cases that are existing in both clinics, especially when they're working together. So it's all a big family here. I think one of the best things about the clinic, if you had to ask me, was all the food that all the societies have for all of their lunches always comes to the clinic. That's the, the golden rule is that we get all the leftovers. So you're always well fed in our clinic. Not that that matters, but it's a it's definitely a bonus. All right, so that's me. My hair color is slightly lighter, but um, I am the uh, supervising attorney. I've been practicing for about 20 years. And I said, you already got kind of my biography at the beginning, so I won't kind of rehash it. Um, I didn't start out as a family law attorney. I really did start doing complex commercial litigation after my uh, after my clerkship. And family law is something I did while I was in law school. Uh, it's something that I, I had familiarity with because of that. In my clerkship, I did family law appeal reviews, so I got exposure there. And it just kind of happened over time, you know, one family law referral to another. And without actually even marketing it, I ended up doing a lot more family law. Um, I think of more interest to me in my practice, besides, you know, here in a school where I'm actually litigating cases when I was doing a private practice, I moved more from litigation to trying to help solve cases, which is why I became a mediator, why I became a social investigator to, to go out in the field and be the eyes and ears of the court and interview the child and, and go to the school and get school records and interview the parents and visit the homes and, and do all this stuff and do a big report and make recommendations to the judge on 
who should have the majority time sharing, what the time sharing schedule should be, and how the exchanges should occur, and any other problems that the parties were having, I would try to provide recommendations to a judge on how to resolve all that. And I just had a trial this morning in which I was testifying on one of those cases that was one of our clinic cases. The cool thing about those cases is the school is being appointed to them now, which means a student gets assigned to them too. And it's an objective analysis. And because we're free, we've been assigned to cases where parents don't necessarily live in Florida. So a student and I this uh, semester went to Dallas and back and produced a report and we went to trial. I've been to Minnesota and back. I've been to Cheyenne, Wyoming and back and Key West and back. So wherever in uh, Ludowichi, Georgia, not that anybody knows where that is, but we actually may have some travel components as a part of our practice. So, okay, so enough about me. So what do we do? Well, pretty much everything as the, as the slide title says, because I don't try to limit your exposure as a student because you graduate and four months from now you have a bar license, you're going to be handling all of this stuff. So I don't try to sugarcoat it. I don't try to find the easy stuff. You, you need to know that you can do it. You may skin your knees. I'm here to help you. I'm here to pick you up. But you can do it. And by letting you get into some of the hard stuff, you get to build that confidence. So we do it all. We do the classic decision of marriage, which could include you know, a custody fight, it's, you know, what the time sharing is going to be, the equitable distribution, the dividing up of the marital stuff and the marital debt, alimony, child support, anything and everything, we can do it. Jacksonville is a huge military town, and so I don't shy away from military cases, which have sometimes their own special needs and special rules. We get um, special awards in the clinic for doing the ABA pro bono military project. Um, so we always are taking on cases through the American Bar Association and we win awards every year for the amount of time that we give to our service members. We handle paternity. I, I, I kind of joke these days, I think, I'm trying to remember the statistics, I just heard them the other day, I think it might be over 50 percent now of most children are not born in wedlock anymore. So we kind of joke about paternity is the new family law, and eventually it's going to change from paternity to some other term because with the same-sex relationships and same-sex marriage and all that, it's not just dads anymore. It's two moms, two dads, and so, you know, the, the nomenclature is going to change over time. Uh, we have relocation cases where one parent's moving, and there's a new statute in relation to that. There's child support, which happens in all those other cases, but can also be done in a special setting under the Department of Revenue. Temporary relative custody, step parent adoptions. We can handle the domestic violence part of a case, which is actually in a separate court, but those cases can be consolidated. But we can actually handle the two different court systems. We have been appointed as guardian ad litem, and a guardian ad litem, all a guardian ad litem is, is a person appointed to represent the best interest of the child. And then sometimes we're appointed as an attorney ad litem, which is, means we're the actual attorney for the child, and we can actually move and make motions and argue on the child's behalf. Um, and you can have both of those, and they can serve different functions. We um, do, as I said, coordinating with the immigration clinic. We do the special immigrant juvenile status cases. We do expert services. My bio calls them custody evaluations because that's what they're called, and that makes more sense to people. But the technical rule language is a social investigator. And I used to be, I said, I used to be an appellate law clerk and I've done a lot of appellate work. And so I don't have any issues about taking a case up to the next level. And we've actually argued um, and done jurisdictional briefs all the way up to the Florida Supreme Court. And um, that's been really cool. And that's, I'll talk about that as one of my highlights. All right. Generally, we're handling about 60 to 80 cases at a given time. We're primarily in the Jacksonville area, which is the fourth judicial circuit. It actually includes Nassau County, which is just north on the Georgia border, Jacksonville, which is Duval County, and then Clay County, which is just south. But we also handle cases down in St. Augustine, um, which is the seventh judicial circuit, and the eighth judicial circuit, which is slightly west of us. And we've actually handled stuff as far down as the land, and we've actually handled an appeal down in Miami at the uh, Third District Court of Appeals, and of course the appeal at Tallahassee at the Florida Supreme Court. So we're not we're not limited to anything. I have a case right now in Gainesville. I'm trying to find local counsel because local counsel is always good to have, you know, to have an attorney who knows the local judges. But if not, we will represent 
this client all the way through as far as we need to because she needs the assistance and there's domestic violence and she comes from a Muslim background, so there's cultural aspects that, that need to be addressed. So um, so that's mainly what we're doing, and, and it's a whole different types of cases. So the 60 to 80 cases are not only divorces, but step-parent adoptions, temporary relative custody, um, custody evaluations, you name it, we've got it. All right, so I, I totally joke, you know, and I know Alex was talking about um, everything that she's done, and I joke about my job is so easy um, because the students do it all. But I have to admit, it can be a nail biter sometimes because they're doing it all under my law license. And I have 20 years of a reputation. I hope it's a good one. And I want to make sure that the students maintain my reputation as well as build their own reputation. Um, and, I, and, I, and it really does mean a lot. I'll give you an example. I had a student that was arguing a case, and John Catman, a local attorney, was the opposing counsel. She did such a good job that the opposing counsel reached out to me after the case was closed asking the student's information because he wanted to talk to her about a potential job. And she was against him, but that was a job interview as in show me what you can do. And she did, and she did well. And he was very impressed, even though she was on the other side of the case. So everything you're doing in front of a judge, in front of opposing counsel, whether you're a member of the um, Family Lines of Court, which is a great mentorship, um, nationwide mentorship program, and other things like that, you are always being watched and judged. And so you always want to be prepared because you are also building your reputation. But as I said, kind of Alex kind of went through this, so I don't um, waste your time by going through it again. But you all do it all. You all are first chair. I am there to help. If you want me in a client interview with you, I will be there. Sometimes that happens on the first time. Second time, the students often do it on their own. Y'all take the first cut at drafting stuff. I may edit it 50 times and drive you crazy, um, but it won't go out this door until I look at it and it is, and it is hopefully perfect and we're filing it because it's your name is, you're signing it too. So your name is on it too. Your reputation is being filed in the courthouse. Um, Y'all respond to all the discovery. Um, Y'all are doing the first chair. You're the one that is at the podium putting in the evidence and doing all the arguments in front of the judge. If you miss an objection, I'll stand up and object to protect the record. But to the extent you're doing it, I don't interfere. Um, hopefully I prepared you well enough that you can do the entire hearing without me even participating or doing more than, than what needs to be done to protect the client. Um, on appeals, the students are doing the briefs, which is a huge, huge undertaking. And they can actually do um, oral arguments if oral arguments are granted by the court. And then again, with those social investigations, where we're the expert, students are going with me to do the home visits, interviewing the children, you know, drafting the report, and then when we go to court, I'm the one in the hot seat who has to testify, um, but they get to sit there and watch the attorneys do a direct and a cross and put me in the hot seat and challenge my report. Um, but that report is something the student put together, so I'm there defending the recommendation that's been made. And so that's really cool. Um, so why should you get involved? I'm going to focus this a little bit on the um, family law and then maybe a little bit broader. But it's an astounding statistics. But 80% of all cases filed in the family law court system, at least here in Florida, one or both parties do not have an attorney. And we're talking about splitting your kids, your biggest asset, your home, your cars. I mean, your life is being totally disrupted, and you can't have an attorney. And then the children, their voices aren't being heard, and they don't get attorneys, um, except in some rare cases, you know, dependency, there's always attorneys in play, and guardian of items appointed and stuff like that. So there are exceptions to what I'm saying. But it's, it's an amazing amount of people who are trying to wade through this difficult process when they're emotional and sometimes not rational. Um, and it's, it's, it's devastating. And Jacksonville Area Legal Aid, actually all legal aid, um, has been decimated in Florida um, with the economic downturn and all that. What happens is lawyers and trust, when they put money in a trust account, the interest on that trust account goes to an IOTA account, which is used to help fund legal aid programs in Florida. Well, the interest rates are so terrible that that money has, has not grown as much. And so legal aids 
uh, organizations are struggling. And although we have Jacksonville Area Legal Aid here and Three Rivers here, they are not doing a lot of family law at all. And so this school right now in a three county area is pretty much it. And so we get more phone calls than we can handle every single semester. So that's why you get involved, because it's important. You help families, even if they're breaking up, you help them do the best they can um, and represent them to a very complex proceeding. Now, here's a cool part for a graduating student. If you did a clinic and you had a CLI um, and you go to a job where the CLI can be used, like the state attorney's office and the public defender's office, those are the two classics, you probably have a very strong advantage in getting a job with one of those agencies because with your CLI, you can continue to use it post-graduation until you officially have your Florida bar license. So that means you're still usable to those offices. You can still go to court and you can still do arguments. As long as you've got a licensed attorney with you, you are functioning as an attorney. And they like hiring students with CLIs because you're immediately usable to the office. And then I can tell you story after story after story about how many times I get emails from local firms that want me to recommend students to them um, because they've been in the clinic and they want somebody with that experience. That local firm, the OMB firm, has one, two, three, four, five, and they're getting ready to get a six former family law clinician in their firm. Um, and they have like three offices. So they're growing by leaps and bounds and they're basically employing all of my students, which is awesome and a real compliment to the program. All right. Best, worst, and most memorable moments. Um, probably my, it was a huge case, but it was very memorable. We represented a deaf father. The, um, the mother was also deaf, and the child was deaf. Mother lived in Miami, Augustine. And for y'all who may not be familiar with Florida, St. Augustine has the um, School for the Deaf and Blind, and it's a fabulous school. And it's actually a public school, but it is phenomenal. Um, Anyway, the father had represented himself. The case had started here, got moved to Miami, and he won. And the mother's attorney, who had been practicing for about 25 years, did um, three appeals immediately out of the case. They did a, what's called a petition for cert um, straight to the court. They did a regular appeal. And then the mom refused to sign a document to let the, school, the child be enrolled in school. They did a, um, another petition for cert on that, and that's when the father was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing, and he reached out to the clinic. So we stepped in at the appellate level and won all three, basically won both petitions. They got denied. We won the appeal. The, um, we had oral arguments down in Miami. It happened to be over spring break, but we had oral arguments down there. The opinion that came out from the court um, actually suggested at the end, although we won the appeal, suggested at the end that the legislature needed to consider some changes about appointing guardian items for special needs children. The uh, mother appealed to the Florida Supreme Court, and we ended up defeating the case on jurisdiction by arguing that the court should not take it because there's no need to make new law in Florida. And most recently, that case has been cited by the Florida Supreme Court when it basically um, just issued out for the very first time standing family law rules. And it was discussing some of the changes to the rules and cited our case uh, in relation to guardian items and the changes to that particular rule. So that was really cool to see our clinic case showing up years later now um, and being cited. I also go to a, um, every year I go to what's called a family law certification review course. And it's basically like taking a baby bar for family law attorneys to be certified. And it's neat when the presenters, and there's like 4,000 lawyers in the room, and if, when the presenters are going through cases and some of the clinic cases are showing up as representative cases of points they're trying to make. And it's just kind of really neat to see us making a mark on the entire um, family law bar. Um, I think the worst thing that's happened in the clinic is clients that just don't listen to you. And there's one, that I know I read the client, the riot act, and no matter what solution I put out there, there was always just another another wall being put up. And at the end of the day, she just didn't want the father to have 
any time sharing. And it was and it was honestly just a ridiculous position. And I knew it. And I told her. And I told her the judge was just not going to have it. And she just wouldn't listen. And sometimes as an attorney, you're stuck representing an untenable position by a client. Hopefully you have a reputation with the court system already of being a fair and reasonable and professional attorney so that the judge will be like, well, this isn't like uh, Natalie Tuttle. It's not like her at all to put this ridiculous position forward because my reputation is not that. And so the judge quickly upon direct examination realized that no matter what, this client was always going to throw the roadblock up. And I had never done this in trial before, but at a lunch break, I asked the, the judge during the direct had asked her a ton of questions. I mean, just challenged her left and right. And if he asked if the car was red, she would tell him the car was blue, even though the car was red. It was that bad. And we ended up settling during uh, the trial because I asked the judge to whether he was forecasting a ruling by his direct examination and represented to him as an officer of the court that I really didn't have any big bombs to throw at the other side. And he, he and I asked him if I could have permission to suggest that to a client to try to pressure her because otherwise I thought it was going to be really bad for her. And, um, and we did that. We ended up settling. Thank goodness we did. But that is so frustrating as an attorney when your client will not listen to you and they just dig and dig and dig a really, really big hole. And so my most memorable moment, and this is really kind of funny, um, the student is now at the public defender's office and, and is doing fabulous work over there. But she was heading, her and I were both walking up to the courthouse, and it has this huge courtyard outside before those steps that you saw. And so we're going there, and it's her very first trial. She's, you know, she's nervous, but she's prepared. And God forbid, she just stubbed and fell flat on her face, hit her knees, and all that, and give her so much credit. She picked herself up. They made sure nothing was ripped and everything was in place. And I remember looking at her going, the worst thing that could happen to you today has already happened. You're going to be a winner from here on out. And she did. She got calm and cool and went in and won her case. And um, But, you know, how scary is that? To so first trial, you fall down. <laughs> it was Okay, I'm laughing. I shouldn't be laughing. But, um, God, I was stuck in my memory because nothing else could happen or go wrong, right, except for falling on the way to the courthouse. So that's a, a, a kind of a funny moment. Um, I just wanted to share something uh, that we have as a first-year student. I don't know if any of y'all actually speak a second language, but if you happen to speak a second language, we are always recruiting students in their first year too, and you can do it your second and third year. But a great way to give back and to do pro bono and actually get in and kind of a part of the clinic in a way is by doing the volunteer interpreter program. We represent a lot of people that speak Portuguese, um, Farsi, Spanish, and so a clinician might be assigned to a case where the client is Spanish speaking and the clinician's not. So we'll need help with translations during client interviews and stuff. And so this is a golden opportunity for a first-year student to get inside looks at client interviewing or other um, activities, that even translation of legal documents, that require um, translator help. And uh, so we have a really cool program that gets everybody involved. Um, I didn't change the PowerPoint slide here because it has Professor Coran, who runs our immigration clinic, and she's the one that has the most need, obviously. But it's a really cool opportunity to get exposure when a lot of times your first year is so crazy that you, and you're not able to do a clinic per se, that uh, you can actually get a sneak peek into it. Um, I want to, again, I'm happy to answer any questions y'all have either during this webinar or if you have other questions. Oh, I should have put my, my, um, my email on here, but it's just in title, T U T T L E at fcsl.edu, and I apologize. You're welcome to send me an email, too. And I wanted to invite y'all, whether you're local or not, um, stop by and see us, and we'll show you around. Or if you wanted to come to spend a day up or you're doing a tour of the school, and you let me know if there's court that morning or that afternoon, I'll be more than happy to take you with me and let you uh, see either a student in action or me in action or whatever's going on and introduce you to some judges and, and some people at the courthouse. and. 
can give you a, a show of what's, uh, what's in store for you when you go to law school. Thank you. All right. Well, wasn't that absolutely wonderful? Thank you very much, Professor Tuttle. Uh, Alex, thank you very much for doing this for us. Uh, with that, we conclude yet another episode of our webinar highlight series. We hope that you found that uh, information helpful. Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for joining us and a very special thank you to my awesome guest speakers, uh, Professor Tuttle and Alex. Thank you very much. I know how busy you are and uh, uh, when you both accepted to do this for us, I was super excited. I knew it was going to be a very informative and, uh, and helpful uh, webinar. So thanks again. Uh, as always, uh, those of you uh, who have been following us, please do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, I saw Alex wrote down uh, both of the emails, uh, both for Professor Tuttle and herself. Um, uh, I have to say, this is this was probably the most informative webinar we've done in a very long time because we had a speaker and we also uh, had answering questions on the side. So once again, bravo, it went very well. Thanks again. Uh, but again, if you still have some more questions or suggestions as, as to how we can improve these webinars, please don't hesitate. Do reach out to us. Um, I'm seeing some. Let me see if there are any questions left before we say goodbye. We have uh, da, 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 da. We, we are just mostly these are thank yous. Well, thank you all for joining and um, from myself and my teammates in the Office of Admissions of Florida Coastal School of Law and my uh, very special guest speakers today. I just want to wish you all a, a great evening and thanks for joining us again. Have a wonderful night. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.